Hi, Betty Jeff here. Uh, just another response to a LinkedIn post here about language, um, call it language death, language attrition, uh, and possibly documenting, preserving, and revitalizing uh, endangered languages. And I kind of want to talk about that because it's my background in working on this. And uh, and especially the fact I'm on the chair I'm the chair of the uh, of the e Linguistics Foundation, which is the uh, the owner of the um, of the Linguist List. And one of the things we do in the Linguist List, they're doing for several decades, is is doing language documentation. Um, some some people there are projects on this that have been funded, and lots of professors and students that work in that area of trying to preserve a languages endangered languages that will likely die um, at an alarming rate. So I want to kind of deal with this, talk about this um, this uh, uh, post here. So languages around the world are disappearing at alarming rate, uh, a phenomenon driven largely by colonization, forced education policies, and the global dominance of languages like English. However, however efforts to document, preserve, and revitalize endangered languages show that dedicated action these languages can be saved and even revived now, i want to talk about that <clears throat> and actually to give a talk on this at microsoft <laughs> so in 19 in 2010 i talked about uh how i helped put um the first minority language into microsoft bing translator and in google translate and i talked about some of these factors, but I'll go ahead and do it in a, in a much shorter version and a little bit. And now looking, you know, hindsight about 15 years back to a little bit more experience on it. Um, languages, uh, it all starts with language attrition. I've actually lived through language attrition, uh, living in France for 35 years. Uh, I have, there have been periods of life where I don't speak much English and and even the first year, I wanted to integrate and assimilate so much in speaking French all the time. And then I did my master's doctoral degree, doctoral degrees here. And, and I was trying to focus on the French part, right, and not forget the English. But then I went back to the States. It's like my English was atrocious, and I never had problems with, with my English. Um, spelling was always perfect, and I was going back, and I just was, my sentences were crap. <laughs> it's just, and I was publishing articles and I was having non-native speakers of English actually correcting my articles and they, <laughs> my papers. And I said, no way, this guy, I can't continue doing this because it had affected the, the, uh, try, the attempt to try to learn so much focus on learning another language to, next, to a very high level affected my own native language speaking skills um, and writing skills. Those are different. I'm not going to go into that detail right here, but <clears throat> and over the years, when I worked on Creole languages, uh, which are in some African languages, and then uh, I was on a few boards of companies that wanted to develop software to do that, uh, and those were that's when I kind of go into how languages can. With dedicated action, they can be saved. The language can be saved and, and revived. And I want to talk about usually they can, but sometimes they can't. That's that's the concern I have. Uh, is that I was the uh, uh, I've seen with Korea language, and I mentioned this in a couple other videos, how uh, it's an issue of the people in the in the countries that are that have been colonized. I totally agree. It's a bit issue of colonization. Um, and forced education policies. Uh, and and there are times when, like in Haiti, it's different because the the language of the, you know, the, the spoken language, Haitian Creole, is, is much more prevalent than is the elite French, which was brought in and has been the main, you know, the, the main official language of the, the past you know, few centuries. But since 1980, um, Haitian Creole has been an official language <clears throat> with an official orthography. <clears throat> so it's, well, one official of 14 different orthographies and spelling systems, which has its own situation itself. But the, uh, but not just the Korea languages. I worked on, um, I was actually on the board of an advisor on a, on a project led by a, 
uh, a guy that had worked with the, um, with the National Science Foundation. And he started a project called Catanal, C-A-T-A-N-A-L. It's computer-assisted, I've got a memory, it's computer-assisted um, translation uh, for Alaskan native languages. Okay, that's where I'm at, the Catanal. <laughs> that's the, the native languages of Alaska. So that's Catanal. Um, that was back in 1998 to around 2001. And that project, we, with my, some of my former colleagues at Carnegie Mellon and Mellon University, we, uh, we tried to get that going and help with that. I just left Carnegie Mellon and came back to France and was advisor on that, that project. And then other colleagues at Carnegie Mellon will kind of work on it too. They want us, we want to support Alaskan languages. And I'd be going back to my 1980s when I'd worked on it, did a paper on the Inuit <laughs> languages uh, for college. And the, the issue that, that I seen with that specific project was the hardest thing was getting the, getting the approval and the buy-in of the leaders, the tribal leaders. Uh, that's a lot of work. And in, in a situation like that where English is the dominant language of both uh, United States and Canada, where those indigenous languages are located, um, it, the, the people yeah, see the need for their children to speak English to be able to survive economically and to have a better life, which is the same as a lot of these other colonized. Well, if you think about actually Canada, <laughs> Canada and the United States are another example of colonization to an extent where it really did take over and it's had some shameful results, especially for the Indians, uh, the native Indians, indigenous Indians there. Um, and the, 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 the issue that's come at, uh, in those situations and in other uh, situations in Africa, South America, the Caribbean and elsewhere is that people will want to try to, they want their children to learn a, one of the, the national language of the country, the official language of the country, which has been imposed by colonization so that they have a better life. Okay. And now we know that part. But then what will happen is the children will have the chance to go to school and meet someone else from a different part of the country or island or whatever, and, and they move away and sometimes even get opportunities to, to get to the, one, of the, one of the countries in, in Europe or in America, North America to be able to study and maybe work. And the result is the children don't come back. That's brain draining. And sometimes they do come back and sometimes they want to support, but the thing is they're supporting, they're supporting the, they're supporting their own mother tongue from a diasporic, uh, being part of a diaspora of being located elsewhere and living elsewhere. And I mean, that's honorable. It's honorable. But the, the, the issue is that they're sometimes not even accepted by their own people. And there are lots of infighting and, that, and I'm not going to go into that too much, but, but I've seen the situations where, and, 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 and my efforts to support a lot of these indigenous languages, or I'll just call them minority languages because they're fighting, they're dealing with, they're fighting against majority international languages. And I just want to simplify and call that. I'm not trying to put any, any intentional, um, Distinction, they're all, they're all languages for me, but there's, I just, they're one, some have international influence. It's major colonizational colon, uh, language that colonize others and influence the imperialistic. And those are the minority that are, that are uh, dealing with their, with their uh, not being able to be pervasive enough and being spread out enough or having enough influence, economic influence or power, whatever you want to call these things. It's all political. It's all, it's all politics. And the, the issue that you'll have is that the parents will, will abandon, stop speaking the, the language to their children 
Uh, or there'll be the children will grow up speaking like in Africa. I've got, I've got friends that grew up in, in Ivory Coast and they spoke French with their brothers and sisters, whereas their parents spoke other languages. But French became the language that the children spoke together in school and because they learned in school. So they stopped speaking it actually. They can still understand it. I have lots of friends that in that situation where they, they, they are able to speak it, but then they go move to France, they go move to Europe, they move to North America, they come back and, you know, they're the ones that have, you know, they have six, been successful, but the, then they lose their language, their, their friends or their family say, what happened? Why well, you can't speak in the language anymore, right? And so this is, this happens in an alarming rate, as we, you know, she and Spose talk about. Uh, and, uh, trying to, trying to bring in Western kind of principles of education. I, I, I really don't, I, 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 I think I'm, I personally now I'm questioning whether or not education, education in a school should be universal, right? I'm not making a statement about that. I'm just, I'm looking at how we've had this forced education policies that are stated here in the post, that that, that brings about, it's, it's, it's imperialism. I mean, it really is bringing in someone other's ideas and imposing it on, on a country. Whereas, you know, before things were doing okay, I mean, people made, they, they were able to make a living. I'm not in the standard living with them as high and that's, that's okay. If people can, you know, they can have a life, they can, they can uh, uh, find food. They can uh, get married and have kids and and uh, and and raise their kids. And the kids do the same stuff. What's wrong with that? You know, why do Why do we have to have more? Why do we have to have education in school? Whereas the, 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 the you've got storytellers that are telling the stories of the the tribes going back and the, the peoples you know, going back for, you know, centuries before thousands of years, if it's going well, why do we have to impose another system on it? Right. It sounds like you know, kind of Tarzan kind of thing. You know, find the guy in the, in the, in the, that, you know, was his parents died and find him in the forest and, and then, you know, bring him back and make him become educated. Right. And, and, and I've been really questioning this and thinking about this as we apply this to endangered languages that are, Getting to the point of being on the root of uh, the kind of at the, getting near to extinction, extinct, extinction. And we have linguists will go out and there will be like five native speakers left of the language. And to spend a, we'll spend a lot of time researching it and trying to document it to preserve it with there's few speakers left. And I think there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns. And, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of colleagues in, in linguistics that work in this. And I'm not saying I don't appreciate what you do. And I'm not saying that I believe it's not good. I'm just saying that at what point do we do this to be able to preserve a language where the language has already gone and declined. And it's not because of the country. It's because the parents don't, the parents themselves are deciding to focus on letting their, uh, helping their children learn the majority language, international language or whatever, you know, the national official language, rather than speaking and supporting their own native language or heritage languages. And that, uh, and that can come through the, through the, through the education uh, school, and all through that. And, and when the parents stop and on top of it, when the parents, go to these, they go and live with the, 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 these, these individuals that go and live in, in um, Europe or in North America, and they marry somebody sometime from, from that, that country they're living in, and they stop speaking the, children, the language to their children, right? They don't do it because they're trying to assimilate into the language that, that they've got. They've finally accessed, and they're finally able to do it, and they, they marry somebody, then they, and that person doesn't want to have them speaking, or I'm not saying something to do, right? Um, but I've seen many cases where they don't. Um, and, uh, and I spoke English to my children, but my wife, I mean, we agreed, and she lived in the States for four years. I mean, we, we, we decided that each of us would, would speak our language to our children. 
I'm linguist. I'm not going to let you know do that. But I know people that don't. I know British and uh, speakers and English speakers in in France and t- didn't speak English to their children, and they were actually English teachers as a job, you know. So, or you know, but there was always this focus trying to promote the local language, uh, the language where you're living, which which is kind of denig- it kind of denigrates the uh, your own personal identity of where you came from. Now, maybe people did that, but I did. I finally didn't want to lose that identity that I grew up with. The, the little bit I've got, I don't want to lose that, right? And so, and I'm not. I don't hang on to. It. I'm not someone that hangs on to. It. You know, I'm American stuff. I'm not that, but but I found that trying to assimilate too much would cause a loss in identity. And I didn't want that to happen. So, so as I bring that down to thinking about uh, uh, the, I have a script here, I'm just thinking, right? I think it comes to endangered languages, language documentation projects, which I support. And I believe we should do it. And I think there are faster ways I talked about it in my micro, talk in Microsoft, my micro lecture about how we can use other approaches like in software, the Microsoft projects, projects and, and products using just localizing those languages or translating the, the, those language, those those software into different languages. It's going to be a way to, to gain support because people will use it in the language they've got. Right? Of, you have Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and you got Microsoft PowerPoint or you know, whatever browser you've got in with menu items all in a local language. People are going to learn it. Right? You just a question of standardization from that point on. But it's not, um, I think that has more influence than trying to convince any political, any politician or minister of education to support and bring the local language, the national language or the native language of most speakers to country into becoming an official language. I don't think that that has as much impact as making software that people use on their phones, right? And their, computer, their phones, really. Uh, and have it in, the, in the, all the menu items in their own native language. I think that's more effective. Uh, but then that pushes towards consuming technology, right? Well, there are there are different reasons of this, and we've got to you know, deal with that. But the I, I think that it's the people themselves that are responsible for whether or not the language is going to survive or die. And sad to say that, but. It's, and there are a lot of economic factors, which I've mentioned, uh, political and economic factors involved. And there's a point in which um, uh, you can dedicate huge amounts of energy to things that won't work or might work. And we can see this in, in Brittany and France, uh, how the Breton language has come back. But it took 20, 30 years with different making a, 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 a regional language uh, teaching diploma to be able to support the languages and all that. And, and seeing, you know, I never could find the native speakers in the Rutan. I'd be going all over and I couldn't find them, right? I were in the wrong pocket, wrong, wrong area. But these, but the people didn't want to speak it. Now they do. And when there's some force, some type of, of uh, motivating factor that allows it to happen, they'll do that if they want to. But sometimes people want to do it in their homes and they want to do it as a community. And there are reasons. And it goes back. There's his, you know, historical reasons per community, per country, per local community. And I, I can't even name them all. I mean, there are books on this. There are tons of books written on this. But I, but I hope to kind of give, here gives an idea of it's kind of complex and it really depends on the situation. And... And I wouldn't say that those are hard and fast rule or there's a one size fits all solution to helping languages survive and endangered languages actually survive and revive or revive and survive. If you want to say it that way. Uh, and when it's possible, it's great. But then there are factors where it's time to say, okay, um, we could do all we want, but then you got to spend a lot of money doing it and getting the funding to do that's really tough. And you got to be a really, really hard. But you got to really do believe it. And, and and sometimes a lot of people will put their own, you know, they'll, it'll become the driving force of what they want to do. And that's great if they can get the funding to do it. Uh, and sometimes you drag your family through this too. It's kind of interesting. So been through that too. Um, and all my projects, all my projects didn't always work out. They didn't always uh, get the funding. Some things failed. 
uh, not all impaled. Uh, and I've, that's taken me and given me some ideas of how to proceed and do things different ways. So you maybe have to do things in a completely different approach rather than just going for funding uh, at the big, kind of large scales, doing it in a different way and do it more grassroots. So there are ways to do it. But. So that's just my thoughts on this topic, which has, there's no right or wrong answer. And I'm still thinking about it and going through the process of as, I, as time goes on of what I believe is most effective in certain situations and maybe others. And, it's, you know, and I'm not going to uh, say that one specific point will work in all situations. They won't. Um, and, and, uh, and there's a point where I believe there's a tipping point where it's still worth it or not. Um, if people get funding for it, better but if you're spending all your energy trying to get that funding you don't get it you don't get it you don't get it yeah you know, I've, I've in some situations I have discouraged people from trying to continue on a project just because said you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself out on this and there's no hint that there's actually be funding for it there's no the traction isn't happening right and uh, and uh, it, it's tough to give a project when you really believe in stuff and, and uh, I just try to be a little more pragmatic and realistic about things now than I was probably 35 years ago. So, uh, but I'm still doing it. Uh, just a little more, maybe a little more wiser, a little more thinking about things before I take on something that, that'll be, you know, I know it probably won't work and it'll be a lot of, but is the waste, is the energy wasted or not? That depends on how you, you, you look at it. So, but, uh, but glad, glad to be able to uh, bring in a comment on this. And thanks for listening to 20, more than 20 minutes of, uh, talking about this, but it's, a, it's something that really does um, affect me, and and I believe a lot of a lot of people and people do want to, you know, we want to support these local languages and make sure they survive to a certain extent. So, thanks for listening.